They're so loving. I got a phone call late last night by one of the members of the congregation. And they said, Wabi, that's how they talk in English. Wabi, we love you and we miss you. And she started crying. And I said, well, I love and miss each one of you. Can I give the phone to somebody else? And I said, sure. And they just went around the group, wanted to call and let me know that they were thinking of me. That's irresistible. That makes me want to go back. Huh? And people may even have a doctrinal difference with you. But if you make them feel loved, they'll come back. They'll put up with a lot of stuff if they feel loved. I mean, now the minute you don't make them feel loved, they'll hightail it out of here. It's a precarious thing, and you've got to love them long enough that they can build roots so that when the wind of change comes, and it will come, there'll be differences, disagreements, but they'll be rooted here and won't want to leave. Are you listening to me? Because love grows. While I was at the first union convention, and Robert Marie was with me, and Donna was with me, and Ema was with me. There were 1,900 people there. That was the biggest convention I've ever been a part of. Wasn't that something, Brother Robert? Our movement was advancing. And after the, the convention, I went to a Jewish museum in the area, and I saw this poster. It simply said, arise and build. It, it was for the shekel program. You, you would buy a shekel, which in those days was just a piece of paper. You, you bought a shekel, and that money went to buy land in Israel. And this was started at the turn of the century. They were literally buying up land for Israel. And so the Spirit spoke to my heart, deep, calling to deep. Not to build a building, but to build the kingdom. Arise and build. This can't be possible unless we're active. Therefore, you are largely responsible for the future of our movement, not just this congregation. We've got to arise and build. And how do we do that? Well, Yeshua gave us the formula. We make disciples. We make disciplined ones. Well, how do I do that? Well, first, we've got to exalt. Then we've got to evangelize. Then we've got to equip. And then edify. Then encounter. And then encourage. Let me put it in simpler to understand terms. We've got to exalt. Exalt Yahweh through worship. So encourage them to come and worship with you. We've got to evangelize lost Israel. We've got to equip workers through teaching and assisting. We've got to equip workers through teaching and assisting. We've got to edify believers through ministry and service because there's nothing that excites people more than getting involved, serving. We've got to encourage, or we have to encounter, excuse me, Yahweh through prayer. See, we can't just do all, all the talking. We've got to listen. And there's nothing that makes you a listener than when you start communicating with someone. If you will ask them to talk to you, they will unload their heart as they build trust in you. And Yahweh will speak to you if He can trust you to listen. But you've got to pray. Amen? And lastly, we've got to encourage one another through fellowship. I love spending time with you. That's how you build a relationship. What kind of marriage would I have had with Ema if I bought her for a buck fifty? 
and then she just showed up on my doorstep. They used to do that in the Wild West days. I got to spend time with Ema. You know what I found out when I spent time with her? Not just that I could put up with her, but I liked her. And then once she tilted that head and leaned forward and I kissed her, I was sunk. She had me. And now she can't get rid of me. I'm like Texas soil. Once it rains, I just stick to the bottom of your shoe and I won't leave. (laughs) We've got a fellowship with one another. We've got to spend time with one another. So the scriptural foundation is we've got to know Yahweh in the power of his spirit and understanding who we are individually, Messiah, and corporately as the commonwealth of Israel. You can see that in Ephesians 1, 1 through 3 and 21. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising Yahweh and enjoying the favor of all the people. And Adonai added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Acts 2, 42 through 47. What's that scripture talking about? It's talking about the first believers. This was the condition of our movement immediately after Shavuot. So there were five, a five-fold purpose to the congregation. Number one, Teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Are you devoted to the teaching that we do here? They fellowshiped. They devoted themselves to fellowship and breaking of bread. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They prayed. They devoted themselves to prayer. They worshiped. Every day they continued to meet together. Woohoo! That's a lot of meetings, isn't it? You're having a hard time just doing Wednesday and Sabbath, aren't you? Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts with glad and sincere hearts, praising Yahweh. And they had an outreach. Yahweh added to their number daily those who were being saved. And lastly, they ministered. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So we've got to catch the vision. I'm asking our congregation to capture the vision. A vision of seeing the building of the congregation and our movement at large as primarily being the ministry of the body of Messiah in which each one of us is an important member begetting other important cells in the body. As Moses prayed, I pray, I wish that all Yah's people were prophets and that Yahweh would put his spirit on them. Says Numbers 11.29. Why do I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, because the Holy Spirit causes the vision of the future. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world even. In the last days, Yahweh has already said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Now I'm going to say something. I don't mean to embarrass anybody. But someone came to me this week with a dream. Yahweh spoke to him in that dream and Yahweh spoke to me. In that dream. And in that dream. Yahweh let us know we are on the right path. With our vision. But he also said. That we need. To understand. How important. And how late the time is. 
This is our last chance to get the movement started. Both in this town and throughout the world. And I'm seeing that like never before. See, not only did he promise to pour out his spirit, he said it in Joel 2.28, and he said it in Acts 2.17, and Acts 2.17, Kepha said, this is that. This is it. Get under the spigot. He's filling up people from within and without. Get under the shower of blessing. See, through the Holy Spirit, the things you don't think you'll do, you'll do. And I'm not just talking about speaking in tongues. That's the least of our worries. I'm talking about it will open up your mouth and fill it with words. The Spirit will bring back to your remembrance the things that you've heard here. And you'll surprise yourself as you're witnessing to people. I know because people have come to me and they're surprised. Rabbi, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and the things you were telling us, it just started flowing out of my mouth. I didn't even know I knew all that stuff. (laughs) You know what's even more surprising to me? That Yahweh opened the door so you could speak to Him. That's what always astounds me. That you'll just be who you are, where you are, And people will walk up to you and start the conversation and you know that Yahweh has opened a door and you have to walk through it. Amen? Why do we need to walk through it? Because this full message of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world as a witness. To all the nations. And then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. It's the only thing that we can do to hasten the Messiah's coming. What? To preach this message. To preach the kingdom. Amen? The word of Yahweh came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and those associating with him. Then take another stick and write upon it, belonging to Joseph, that's to Ephraim, and all of those associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. When the people ask you, when the people ask you, when the people ask you, open up your mouth. When the people ask you, won't you tell them what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says. I'm going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you've written on, and say to them, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they've gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There'll be one king over them. They'll never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any other of their offenses. For I will save them from all their sinful backsliding and I will cleanse them. They'll be my people and I'll be their Elohim says Ezekiel 37, 15 through 23. Messiah says, that's what I came to do. For Messiah himself is our peace, or our wholeness, who has made the two one, that's Judah and Ephraim, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the hatred for the Torah with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making wholeness, or peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to Yahweh through the gallows, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away in the diaspora, and peace to those who were near in Judea. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with Yahweh's people, members of Yahweh's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Messiah Yeshua himself as the chief capstone, In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in Yahweh. So we've got to rise and build. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which Yahweh lives. We become a Bethel by his spirit, says Ephesians 2, 14 through 22. So this is our challenge. Our immediate challenge at Agadabris is to appreciate the gift of the kingdom in our midst 
and to live the words of our prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth just like it's done in heaven. Matthew 6.10 He's already commanded us. For I will give the command and will sift the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is sifted in a sieve and not a kernel will reach the ground. Says Amos 9 and 9. So if someone rejects this message, ladies and gentlemen, they're not Israel. They're not a kernel because he's already promised not to let a kernel fall on the ground. So you give the message out and Israel will run with it. They will embrace it. They'll say, this is what I've been looking for all my life. Amen? Open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest, says John 4 and 35. Now is harvest time. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans. Do not enter. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, here's what you preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 10, 5 through 7. So he's already commissioned us to go. He's told us where to go and where not to go. And he's even loaded our lips and said, this is your message. Messiah answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Sovereign, then help me. Matthew 15, 24 and 25. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father by authority of the Son through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's the Torah. And lo, I am with you always, even to the close of this age. And this is the age of redemption. Matthew 28, 19 says, The next age is the age of Messiah, when he's already here and he's already established his kingdom. So we must be in our local community. Our congregation, Agadah Bris, must live out this call to Central Texas. It is we who must preach the full message of the kingdom here and now. We've already been given a unique revelation about the kingdom. We've gotten the three pillar message. Do you realize that message was birthed in this congregation? The three pillar message out of Isaiah 56 says, keep the Sabbath, love the name of Yahweh and hold fast to the covenant. No one else was preaching that. And Yahweh gave that message here. And now it has literally encircled the globe. People are running with this message. Number two, we uniquely was given the majority revelation. That if by the end times, the majority of the people living on this planet would be of Abraham, would be of the house of Israel. And they wouldn't know it. And we would be called to go out and sift those lost Israelites from the nations. We wrote a whole book about it. And now it is a major message being preached. I was listening on the on the uh, YouTube the other day. And a guy was preaching about this message. And using the passage of Ben Nivrechu. Where it has been preached. Through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. But he brought out, no, that means grafted in or mixed. And he called it the majority revelation. So I knew here was a man I never met before in my life. But this revelation had touched his life. Now he's preaching it. Number three, that the Zedekite priesthood is for the time of the end. And that he would select men and women to be Zedekite priests. For a tribulation ministry. As Melchizedek, he is the high priest of the Zedekite priesthood. And you are the Zedekite priests. According to Hosea 3, 3-5 and Amos 9, 11-14. So Yahweh has given this body, this body, some unique truths to proclaim. Amen. To achieve the goals, we have, number one, We've established a congregational presence consistently and progressively. First on the little house on General Bruce Drive. And now in this wonderful, spacious building that the painters have been so kind to donate the use of here at 2006 South 57th Street, Temple, Texas. Number two, we've created an internet presence at www.agadabris.com. 
which continues to be our greatest tool for drawing in new members. Now, we recently have increased our presence on the Internet, not just to have a website, but also on the most popular social group, Facebook. And Brother Gerald maintains that for me, and he's been doing a wonderful job. And we've seen some wonderful fruit from that ministry. We now have exceeded the 2,000 mark of people, friends, that have logged on to our place. Number three, we started door knocking and inviting people to our prophecy seminars. And we've been doing this quarterly. Now this is being replicated all over the world. Thailand's using it. Australia's using it. New Zealand is using it. People around the United States is using it. And they're wanting us to come and do it in their local areas. 92% of people who go to a house of worship do so because somebody invited them. Not because they wandered in. Sheep beget sheep. I mean. Number four, we literally established an international. This little body has established an international presence. Our radio program that began in the, with the help of hearts here, paying, I think on an average, around $250, $300 a month, to be on locally in this market. And then Yahweh used that effort and catapulted, literally catapulting it around the world. We're on the Nazarene radio network. On the Nazarene radio network, you have to log on to listen. One evening, as I had left here and gone to our program, this was the second night that I would be guest hosting. And on that we broke 3 million 200 and something thousand listeners. That's why we're on the Nazarene Radio Network. We're also on KKMC out of Salinas, Kansas. Brother James All is the manager there, and so he's given us free time to be on that radio station. We're on KPJC out of Salem, Oregon. Again, we've gotten free time given to us there and we're on several times a week in that market. We're on the Hebrew Nation radio, both with our broadcast, but also I'm a uh, member of the Torah roundtable discussion. And you say, well, how, how important is that? There had been the congregation in Thailand had been listening to me for some time, but it was when they heard us talking on the Torah roundtable that they knew that I was the one they wanted to bring over. So that Torah roundtable is very important. People log in there and listen on Tuesday and Wednesday at 10 o'clock through 12 o'clock. And we're also on MessianicVoice.com, which is another Messianic congregational uh, radio station on the Internet. So we're in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Thailand. So we've got a congregational presence. We've got seven so far, seven congregations committed as being Torah teaching, Yeshua believing congregations. We also have four congregations in Australia and one in New Zealand. Number five, we posted Reuben Prager, our direct link to both the Holy Land and the Temple. By blessing his ministry, we continue to be blessed. He is also our second best outreach in the Central Texas area. Many of you started coming after you listened, came and listened to uh, Reuben as he proclaimed the restoration of all things. Number six, we've written two books, The Majority Revelation and Spiritual Warfare Equipping Gideon's End Time Army, publishing them at Lulu. Uh, press.com or lulu.com which is lulu press and more books are in the planning i've got one already uh, finished on the kingdom and i've just got to get it uh, edited and so we're planning more to be released this year why is that important because people begin to read these books and then they want to find out who it is that's writing them and they'll come here and uh, sit under this ministry number seven we make educational trips to israel 
And so we're planning on trying to put someone to, together this year so we can all go and, uh, and, and learn because there's nothing like being in the land to learn the message. It gives you a living atlas to your faith. It's all about the journey. I said it's all about the journey. The future of our congregation is a journey. And on a journey, one needs input and observation. And that comes through good co communication between the leadership and the congregation. Yahweh must be at the center of our, er of our effort. We need to discern Yahweh's vision for his congregation at this location and at this time. Number two, we need to capture the vision. It's not just to justify what we're already doing. The ultimate purpose is to call lost Israel from the nations making converts. Number four, it's not a gimmick. <laughs> this is real. Number five, it takes work, dedication, and commitment for the long haul. Number six, leadership should get a fresh glimpse of the vision unbiased. Number seven, holy frustration motivates you to seek clarity for the journey from Yahweh. So when you feel begin to feel frustrated at where you are in Yahweh, that's not the time to gripe. That's not the time to murmur. That's the time to get on your knees and say, Father, show me what you are doing. Number eight, possibility of experiencing outcomes that we could never imagine. Number nine, shepherds tend the flock by taking them to the location of nourishment. That's my job, to take you to the location of nourishment. Number 11, the leader must lead. We must know where he's going to get others to follow. That means you're going to have to learn to listen to the messages. These are not just pep talks. When I preach to you, I am showing you the message of the hour, where we're going for that hour. So you need to know where we're going. To do that, you need to listen what I'm communicating to you. I mean, then when I open up the floor to questions, if you have a question of where we're going, that's when you speak. There's got to be communication for us to be successful. I mean, so it takes three kinds of leadership. The entrepreneur. The entrepreneur looks to a visionary future, even thriving on change. Next, the manager. The manager focuses on precedent and resists change, seeing status quo as sacred. You say, well, well, both of them would be tugging at each other. That's right. And you get balance there, don't you? And lastly, the technician lives in the present, most concerned with getting the job done. Do you see? You have a perfect balance. You have the technician holding on to the present. You have the manager, and he resists change. And then you have the entrepreneur, and he wants to change all the time. And those pulling gives us balance. We need all three types to be a balanced congregation. It's a continuum. Amen? So what is vision? It's the ability to see. A leader must be able to see. A vision is a clear and challenging picture of the future. It is as great as Yahweh and as specific as here. Yahweh's specific plan for a specific congregation at a specific time. A vision clarifies direction. Where are we going? Why are we going there? And what will we look like when we arrive? Without vision, the people wander aimlessly. They don't know what to do. So what is our vision? I'll put it to you plain. Our vision is to seek and to save what was lost. It says Luke 19.10. You say, well, that's the words of Yeshua. As Zacchaeus' house. You're exactly right. But it's still true today. We're to seek lost Israel. And we're to save our kingdom. That was lost. But now it's found. Amen.
So this is the vision profile. We've got to know what the community needs. The leadership has to have passion for the future. And we've got to have con- congregational support, both in spirit and in monies. That's an ideal vision. I mean, you say, well, I pay my tithe. It takes more than tithes, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to take sacrificial giving. I mean, why do we even need a vision? Well, the importance of vision is this. Number one, it works as a filter in which everything we do is filtered. It prompts passion. It facilitates function. It aligns and focuses all resources to concentrate properly. It offers sustenance. It invites unity. If we all are flowing in the same direction, we'll be unified. Number seven, it encourages energy. And lastly, it's used daily as a test to direct priorities. Amen? But here are vision killers. Ruts. Ruts express itself like, well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, you know what a rut is. That's a grave with two ends kicked out. I don't want to die. Not until Yahweh says it's time. I mean, fear expresses itself like, oh, well, I just don't know. We'll sit down, let somebody else that does know we'll get going. Number three, generalizing. Trying to please everyone. Let me tell you something. If you're advancing, you're offending. I said, if you're advancing, you're offending. If you're changing, if you're progressing, somebody is going to get upset. But upset's good. It's a motivator. See, if you get offended, you're going to, you're going to express yourself. I mean, next, stereotypes. They will kill. You know what stereotypes say? Well, they always. Oh, well, they never. Oh, we can't. Man, we, we kill can't and beat could till he would. Another vision killer is complacency. Why do we even need to do this? Another is fatigue. I'm too tired. I don't got any energy. That sounds like work. You better work. Because if you don't, you'll die. Have you ever noticed <laughs> people retire? Sister Marie, and it seems like just a few months after that, they die. What's up with that? You know what my dad said? He said, I'm not going to retire. I'm going to refire. <laughs> he retired, and he's working now more than he ever did when he was pastor. Another vision killer is short-term thinking well maybe next year who knows no no there's no time like the presence you see where there is no vision the people perish but he that keeps the torah happy is he psalms 29 and 18 so see this model there's a bunch of little arrows going upward isn't there but they're little And there's no real focus to this congregational ministry. But sometimes we have to cancel some things so that we can refocus on what our main objective is. What's our main objective? To seek and to save what is lost. Amen? That is everything we need to be doing. It'll be a journey to achieve such focus. But we must know where we're headed. Amen? Big ideas, grand vision. So do you understand the vision? Can you see it? Can you do it? Will you be here to do it? Do you believe in it? Do you believe it's from Yahweh? Are you convinced? Only you can answer those questions. So here's the summary of what we talked about. 
Here's what you think I told you. <laughs> Number one, I do not believe we're doing all that we can or should to serve Yahweh. Do you agree with that? We must be about the Heavenly Father's business. The ability to handle diverse people and to be tolerant of others' baggage is a strength. Number four, members show love and care deeply and consistently. Number five, focus must be clear and centered. Number six, people come here because they have a need. Number seven, they stay here because they're welcomed, accepted, and joined to our worship, and they sense love. That's why it seems like we have a group of misfits here. We have a group that are needy, and they've seen their need, and they feel like they can get their need met here. Number eight, they leave here when their need is met. They have not invested, and they could not find a way to fit in, and they did not belong. That's what causes people to leave. Number nine, we must be clear on what we believe Yahweh wants this congregation to be. And lastly, we must know where we're going. Is that clear? So we do have some areas of improvement. We need more urgent outreach. We need to help new members assimilate more. And I think the efforts of uh, Doc and Sister Beverly, they have the new members pr uh, class and they've really done well in getting people to come there and learn. Number four, or number three, focus on ministry, adult, children, and teens. When we get them, we've had some children come here.